All right. Well, um, I just want to take this moment and welcome everybody to our first virtual Henrietta State of the Town. Um, glad I'm going to join us online as well as a few uh, board members uh, from Henrietta, part of Henrietta, and also the Chamber. So I just want to take a moment to thank everybody for coming in, and I'm going to take the time to introduce Bo Wright, the Superintendent of West Henry School District to talk about our development. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, to begin, I would like to uh, thank our uh, Henrietta uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, members and acknowledge them for their steadfast support of our students and our schools. Um, I would like to uh, thank the members of the William J. Welsh Scholarship uh, Awards Committee because in a minute we're going to be uh, acknowledging our recipients. The members of the committee uh, are as follows. First and foremost, our committee chair and uh, assistant superintendent of finance and operations, Andy Whitmore. Thank you to him. He, he runs a tight ship and uh, he oversaw the process and made sure that we progress nicely and protect everyone in line. So thank you, Andy. Um, our other members and our strategic partners, Joe Curie from Rebella Associates, Jeff Day from Day Automation, uh, Sue Jacek from Virtual Automotive, and Brandy from Reliant Federal Credit Union. Thank you uh, to your contributions as far as, uh, again, moving into the forward and uh, selecting our recipients who were so, so deserving. So, um, as usual, we have a, a really competitive pool of candidates, and um, we ended up with some, some really great students, very deserving students. Our winners this year were Parker Hoyt, Lacey Hartman, and Emily Martini. And I just want to um, share some information about uh, our winners this year. Starting with um, Lacey Hartman, who has uh, participated in travel softball, Girl Scouts, DECA, and Youth Asset Team. She is also a member of the American Sign Language and Business Honor Society and works part time as an office clerk. Lacey plans to study business administration at Monroe Community College, where she also will be playing softball this fall. So, uh, very proud of Lacey, and I just want to share with you um, a statement that Lacey wrote to the Chamber, where she said, thank you so much for the invitation to attend the Henrietta Chamber of Commerce State of the Town meeting. I'm wrapping up my senior year felt most important to attend my virtual classes today and stay in track with um, She goes on to say, I ultimately decided to attend Monroe Community College and live on campus. By doing so, I would be able to keep my student loans to a minimum during my first two years of college. Uh, this will allow me to continue my studies in college that offers a, an MBA. My career goal after completing my MBA would be to begin working for a successful market firm to learn as much as I can. Once again, thank you for honoring me as uh, the recipient of the William J. Welch Memorial Scholarship. This scholarship will certainly help me to achieve my educational and career goals. And I would be sure to carry Mr. Welch's ideals and passion with me. That is Lacey Hartman. Parker Point was another one of our winners. Parker is well regarded uh, for his work on the Business Honor Society, National Honor Society, Depth Club, Link Crew, Student Council, and Senior Class Council. He also has volunteered at the high school's Comic Cafe and has worked for the past two years at the Bellas Italian Market. 
Parker, and he majored in accounting and will be attending the Rochester Institute of Technology this fall. We're very proud of uh, Parker and his accomplishments. And then last but not least, we have uh, Emily Martini. And Emily has been working at Reed's Ice Cream and Wegmans, and she plans to attend Niagara University in the fall, where she will be studying business with concentration in marketing. And she too uh, wrote a statement that she wanted to share with the chamber, where she says, I am beyond grateful to receive this amazing scholarship and the opportunity to attend a town meeting. Unfortunately, I will not be able to attend the meeting as I have my AP, microeconomics, and that. Um, I would have loved to attend to share how honored I am to be receiving the scholarship. I appreciate the Henrietta Chamber of Commerce for selecting me for such an amazing award. This scholarship really does mean the world to me and my future aspirations as a marketer who will work for an MBA as well as pursue law school to become a business lawyer. I promise to make the committee and the legacy of the William J. Walsh Memorial Scholarship proud. Thank you to Emily and congratulations to all of our scholarship winners. At this point, I would like to uh, turn the microphone over to our town supervisor, Steve Schultz, who will be discussing the state of the town. Thank you. Good afternoon. When you hear some of the uh, accomplishments of the students, and I was thinking feel like a slacker. <laughs> um, let's start up. I know so I can keep track of uh, how long I'm going. Okay, uh, welcome to the 2021 State of the Town Address for the Town of Henrietta. Um, and again, thank you to the Chamber for hosting this event annually. Um, and let's so, of course, the big story, if you will, last year, as with everything, was dealing with the pandemic. Um, so, Henrietta was one of the few towns that um, did not close operations at Town Hall during the pandemic. Um, we may have had like an afternoon where there was a potential um, contamination event where we had to sh shut down, just like I said, for the rest of the day and be contaminated. But um, we kept operations going the entire time. To better serve the community and ensure safety of both our workers and the public coming in, um, we added a fast-food service window, external drop box, internal drop boxes. Um, we put in remote automatic doors so we could essentially buzz people in, uh, and we added extra queuing time. So we put in a lot of places that uh, things at Town Hall to essentially be able to keep operating in a safe manner, even through the. I'll call it the darkest phase of the pandemic. Um, we were actually the last town to provide passports and wedding licenses. And the only reason we shut them down is because we were having people come from surrounding, not just surrounding towns, surrounding counties, because we were the only ones doing it. And so we decided that that was putting our uh, town clerks at too much risk, because now you were bringing people from across population pools, which of course during the pandemic is not a good um, they are opening back up. We just announced that, so we've started to schedule our first uh, passport sessions and uh, wedding licenses. We were still doing wedding licenses on a um, individual basis. That's you know, but that's something we're starting to open back up. So it's great to see this stuff starting to come back. 
Um, at the library, same thing, we provide a curbside, online, book drop, book quarantine, all sorts of things to, again, offer maximal service while with also maximizing safety. Um, they had virtual story times, and when the weather was nice, they held them outside. Um, we increased our cleaning regiments. We did this all through the, the town, um, but especially in the library. Um, and basically, as the stuff started to change, we've been safely reopening and expanding our services. And I know the staff can't wait until the library is back fully open. They can have, you know, another, as we were just talking about before the talk, a confetti drop on New Year's Eve. Um, we were one of the few towns that did fireworks, and we even considered doing a normal full nighttime fireworks, but again, the problem with being the only town that does that, we would have had everybody from across the county here. So we ended up doing it as part of our reverse parade. We had combined our Memorial Day parade, which had been postponed, with uh, Fourth of July fireworks and, and held in uh, events um, rather successfully. It was the first one we, we tried and worked out really well. We also did something similar on um, Halloween with the food and drive through. We had Santa and I, myself, Rob Barley, and a few others played Santa um, outdoors so that kids could still uh, ask Santa for gifts um, and get pictures taken with Santa. Um, and there were a number of other pandemic safe events. Um, for gymnastics, for instance, they did virtual lessons. So the kids actually, they essentially did their gymnastics class over Zoom. Um, The uh, we switched. Oops, I want to punch my. There's a below. Thank you. We switched our board meetings to virtual participation, um, and as soon as we were allowed, we reopened to hybrid, and that's where we are today. And we're probably going to keep going that way. Um, you know, whether we continue to allow uh, presenters to be virtual, um, we will certainly continue to allow the public to be virtual. So that um, we basically felt it has increased the amount of participation in town board. So um, you know, not everything that's come out of the pandemic has been neg and negative. Um, and basically, we were able to balance things throughout the town to keep almost our entire workforce intact. Um, a few of the locations that were depend that basically the entire facilities were closed. We had to have some folks on unemployment, but otherwise, you know, we worked hard to find jobs for other people to do so that we weren't creating burdens for employees. Um, but we also did so in a manner that meant we were not financially hurt. So, you know, we came out of the uh, it okay financially, and you'll see that in a little bit. And then we did a lot of work to support the community. Um, we held um, massive, two massive uh, disposable mass distributions in cooperation with the county. Um, and uh, this was early on in the pandemic when PPE was hard to come by. It was very well received. Um, all, we basically did uh, food link mobile pantries all throughout the pandemic. Um, in fact, they only just recently stopped. Uh, you know, a lot of very appreciative people who um, you know, we're having food insecurity issues due to the pandemic and the effects it's had on their lives. And we did grab and grow, grab and go lunches with the seniors for the seniors, as well as other services, um, you know, virtual, like every year we typically help with taxes. We, wherever we could, we did those services virtually. We assisted the Rush Henrietta Central School District with their distribution of lunches. Um, that was one of those things where we had crossing guards, any crossing guard person who wanted to continue to work, we had them help with those distributions, um, and, th and that was very successful. The, the um, library provided free Wi-Fi access for anybody who didn't have it. They could come and park right next to the library and pick up free Wi-Fi, and we coordinated with the Red Cross to host numerous blood drives. Um, you know, where they normally have their blood drive, it's not a super large space, so it ran into some issues from a 
um, pandemic standpoint. So to be able to use our recreation center really helped out. As far as the financial impacts, um, we saw $1.5 million decline in revenues as compared to 2019. And whereas that might have been a problem, we acted quickly and we were able to um, offset that and save um, $1.7 million in expenses. Um, now you can argue some of the stuff, could we have gone a little bit lighter? Well, at the time we were doing it at the start, we had no idea how long and how strong this thing was gonna be. The good news is some of those savings were projects that we just delayed until this year. And so um, it, you know, in terms of, I feel really good as far as what we decided to cut and what we decided to keep and what we decided to delay. Um, and as a result of that, we were able to move forward with zero tax increase this year for the, from the town. So um, again, thanks to everybody, all the departments who put in efforts to figure out what they could do to, to help with cost savings and to get that all put together and rolled up into a budget. Um, a lot of work on the part of my finance director, director Linda Salpini. Um, so again, you know, one of the things that was our ultimate goal because we felt it was very important for both residents and businesses to not increase their taxes during a time when many of them were struggling financially due to the effects of the pandemic. The good news is there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you know, we were just talking about, I think everybody in this room is vaccinated or if not just about. Um, as a result, as the vaccination levels have been going up, infection rates have been going down. Um, you know, there have been some holdouts and some uh, pockets where there's higher infections than we would like. But um, the good news is that, like I said, we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. We're starting to see um, cases drop. Um, and, uh, you know, sadly, we did lose a lot of residents in Monroe County, far too many. Um, but, uh, the good news is, like I said, hopefully it's coming to an end. So financial health of the town. As you can see, uh, all of our expenses were under. Um, in across all the different departments. Uh, a bunch of our revenues were under um, because there were some, uh, one of the areas that did not see a slowdown due to the pandemic was construction. Um, in fact, we actually had more construction revenues than we were expecting. And so that offset a lot of our um, projected or budgeted uh, income, our budgeted revenue. So uh, we weren't hurt nearly as bad as we would have thought. But, um, you know, again, a lot of the delayed, a lot of the savings and expenses were projects that were delayed till this year. So those were added back to the budget for this year. Um, these were the major expenditures in 2020. Um, this is actually from the slide from last year. So there's a couple of those that we did delay uh, not, not a whole lot, um, but basically we did complete the West Wing renovations and that was actually helped a lot in terms of being able to better safely service the public as we now had two large counters so we could spread people out um, when they came in for building permits or engineering work. Um, we did move forward on the, um, the landscaping for the library and the rec center. We did move forward on the um, repairs to the Tinker House. In a lot of those cases, those funds are immune to COVID. So if they are based off of, um, you know, so for instance, the uh, repair is from a park fund that gets um, replenished from building fees. So again, that one did not get affected by COVID. Uh, the, the Highland Road sidewalk on the far right, we did delay. Um, we did buy our new plow trucks because one of the things COVID didn't slow the, the snow down. Um, we did delay the uh, culvert, the additional culvert going into Memorial Park. In fact, it's under construction right now. Um, and then uh, we, we redid the roof 
uh, we did move forward with fixing the roof for Town Hall because, uh, again, COVID wouldn't stop the rain. So, um, it, for 2021, uh, we've been did actually we're able to get some of it done uh, already, and there's more coming. Uh, new sidewalk on East Henrietta Road. Uh, this will help a lot in terms of pedestrian for the area and especially for kids going to school. Um, while the senior center was closed, we took the opportunity to add a three seasons room. Uh, we're in the process of building a new sewer and drainage garage. We were hoping to start that this spring. Uh, material costs for steel and lumber are through the roof. So we're actually gonna delay it till the fall. Um, and depending on what the bids come back in the fall, if the prices haven't fixed, then it may actually be delayed until next year. It doesn't make sense for us to build it now when the prices are highest. Um, we are gonna be moving forward on the uh, sidewalk. And again, we're adding more plow trucks. So if you remember from a few years ago, one of my goals is, is to increase the um, amount of personnel in the highway department from a plowing standpoint. When I first took office, it took five hours to clear the roads. So about two and a half to three hours for the main roads and two to two and a half hours for the side roads. Um, if you're getting an inch an hour, that's way too long. And so this past winter, it was just over three hours. My, ultimately, the goal is to be able to do them both simultaneously. Today, we essentially clear the main roads. When we're done, we go and clear the side roads. The problem with that is if we've got one of those heavy storms that's dropping more than an inch an hour in the early morning hours, and that was quite common two years ago, what you ended up with is by the time we were done clearing the main roads, we had to clear them again. So one time, you know, that then causes problems for the school buses coming in to get into the side roads. Well, we decided one time to try to clear the side roads. We had people who couldn't get up Methodist Hill, couldn't get up East River Road because of the snow on the road. So we basically said, we'll never do that again. But the goal is to have a full crew clearing the main roads and a half crew clearing the side roads. It'll still take them the, you know, three plus hours to clear the side roads. But again, even if we have to keep on the main roads that whole time, the side roads will get cleared. So that, that's an important goal. And we're doing that a little bit at a time. Um, that, that's one of the, the efforts. One of the things we're gonna have to look at is what do we do with those people in the off season? Um, and we've, we've got a couple ideas in that regards that I'll talk about later. Uh, this is the 2021 adopted budget. Um, so basically, it, you know, the big highlight is that there is a zero dollar increase or not one penny more on the tax levy change. And actually, because the way they do stuff, when we submit that in, they subtract out any uh, recapture or other payments that were due us from the previous tax year first our tax levy actually dropped by 0.4%. Um, the uh, projected tax rate dropped about 8.5%. It was actually a little bit higher than that. Um, this came from the budget slide. I did not have the time to go back and calculate what the actual change was, but um, it did appear to come out a bit higher than that. One of the things we do, we subtract out the fund transfers. It's you kind of unique to government accounting. If I transfer $100,000 from general to the library, it gets counted twice in the, the budget roll up because it shows as $100,000 expense in the general and $100,000 revenue in the um, library. And then the 100,000 they spend it on expenses shows up. And of course the 100,000 we collected in taxes shows up. So it appears multiple times coming from the business world, it made zero sense to us. So we always back it out. So it's it just, it's much more easy to compare years past because if you have a big transfer, so for instance, anytime you're doing a major capital project, you move the money into that capital fund and it would get counted twice. So for clarity's sake, we get rid of all that. Um, I will notice that last year our debt was 2%. This year it's 3%. Our debt didn't go up. In fact, it went down a little bit. The difference is because our budget is much smaller, it 
shows up as a higher percentage. Uh, I did it again. I don't know why sometimes there's a long delay. Okay, um, so here's our fund balances. Um, because of the delayed projects, you see our fund balance went up. Um, and uh, drainage went down some because last year, uh, or two, basically the, it was the rest of our payments on the, um, the Castle Road culvert that we put in. If you remember, uh, we, uh, in 2019, we started uh, replacing the Castle Road culvert, which had gotten dangerously uh, undercut by the creek. And uh, so that's why there was a significant drop there. Um, but overall, again, very healthy from a town standpoint. Um, <clears throat> what we've decided to do is, because you can transfer money from general funds into highway and library, but not the other way, we leave their fund balances where they're at. And if they start to get too low, we move money into them, but we don't try to keep them at 20%, uh, which is our goal our target. And in fact, basically by budget time, all those numbers will have to be at 20%. What that means is we either take, in this case, the roughly 5% additional and apply it to next year's taxes to keep the, the taxes down and or it gets moved into a capital account. But the target at the end of the day are those uh, surpluses for the, for the top three will be at 20%. Uh, drainage and sewer, you want it greater than 20% um, because they have to deal with potential catastrophic failures. So as you know, we started work on a uh, new town court. Um, we've got the plans complete. One of the things that I was insistent in is from an architectural standpoint, because this is going to replace the uh, built at the location of the old library, we wanted to bring in the architectural element of that front tower uh, into the new building, although it does not include the HVAC, which was a horrible design of the old library. Um, and I could see our librarian smiling and shaking her head because it was a nightmare for them. Um, again, this is gonna be on hold for a while until the construction prices come down. In addition, we're going out looking for funding sources. Um, the goal is to do this with as minimal impact to the taxes as possible. Um, it, if it has to go out to bond, it'll be put, put on a referendum. Um, the American Rescue Plan, or which some, most people refer to as COVID Relief Act, has some funds coming. It's still not fully defined what the different categories are. So for instance, it doesn't expressly say you can be reimbursed for COVID expenses, although it does talk about uh, money spent to uh, make the town safer during a pandemic. So we're hopefully getting some clarification. There's a meeting coming up, um, but basically our initial calculations as we look at it, the total amount that was allocated for the town is about 4.6 million. Um, we calculated, like I said, it's about 1.5 million in, in lost revenue, roughly uh, $450,000 in expenses. Um, those are ones that haven't already been recaptured, but again, we don't know, that could be zero. It's, it's, it's that ambiguous right now. Um, and then there's another category for infrastructure improvements. Even that's ambiguous, because right now the language is it has to be water or sewer improvements that help the entire town. Well, I'll tell you, there's no such thing. The closest you come to for water, for instance, would be a water for pur water purification plant. Well, we don't supply water, the county does. And even if we did, a water purification plant doesn't help anybody on well. Just like a sewer uh, treatment plant wouldn't help anybody on septic. So there's no such thing as a water or sewer infrastructure that helps everybody in town. They need to fix that language. Um, I know what they're trying to say. They don't want it to go to individuals, but it ought to be able to fix entire net neighborhoods. Um, you know, as soon as I hit it, it's going to double go. Oh, it didn't. Okay. 
So here's where I'm looking at it, assuming they get the language right. Um, that to me, there's a number of places that are currently on wells. And to me, one of the highest priority ones is there's a portion of Middle Road that has been zoned industrial. It was rezoned by a previous town board. It's industrial now. They're still on wells. Uh, there was a contaminant spill a mile or so away. Um, hopefully it hasn't reached their well water yet, but it's certainly something we want to fix. Um, so that would be one of the high priorities. There's a number of other neighborhoods. To me, water takes priority over sewer, right? If, if I have bad water, that's a health condition. Septic is a perfectly viable solution for, for dealing with sanitary waste. Um, if there are funds left, then we will basically look at um, offsetting sewer installations for our one neighborhoods. Um, that doesn't mean that people won't pay some portion of a sewer district extension fees. The goal is to keep it to a manageable level to where people can afford that. We were able to do that for Lehigh Station Road across from the high school last year thanks to a community development block grant funding. So the, again, the idea is to get the cost down to where people can afford to, to switch over to sewer if they so desire. It doubles jumped on me. That's okay, don't worry. The, the previous one was just a title page. So we've got an exploding real estate market. Um, home prices were up 18% on average compared to the previous year. Uh, median sale has now risen to $220,000. Um, nine days average on the market or median. Uh, that's about a third compared to the previous year. Uh, interestingly enough, the Part of the reason for all this is because the inventory has been declining. There's about a third of the number of houses up for sale as compared to a previous year. So um, that's driving a lot of this. Most offers, they're all cash offers, non-contingent, and I say about 20%. It's actually 20 to 30. I've even seen one 60% over. In fact, I made one that was 60% over. Um, the asking price was 55% over the assessed price and we went 60% over. Um, and so of course, that means that current event assessments do not reflect our current house prices. So, thank you. So basically we're starting the reassessment process. A bunch of people have gotten letters. They're all saying, why am I, some houses are being reassessed even though they were reassessed in the last year or two. The reason is because your neighbors are selling their houses way above reassessment. One of the misconceptions of reassessment, I stress this every year, the town does not get one penny more by raising assessment. How much we collect is done at budget time as part of the levy. Um, last year we had to reassess over 10,000 homes. This year it's just over 3,000 homes. So we're not having to reassess as much as last year, but we still have to reassess a lot of homes. Um, one of the things, again, it doesn't matter to us what the, the re reassessment is. It has to be fair. And so we will happily help you challenge it if you think it's unfair and can demonstrate to us that you're right and we're wrong, we will fix it. Um, so we make available all this, the, the material you need to fight your assessment. Um, one of the things I point out, you have to use legitimate stuff. People come into us with Zillow numbers or all these things. Under state law, we, we can't pay any attention to them. They're not valid. It has to be from the sales book because under assessment law, it's the sale of properties over a particular period of time. So if the sale was outside that period of time, it doesn't get counted. And it has to do with the condition of the property as of a specific date. But also if there are things about your property you know, you can get from the assessor's office what the current state of your property is. And if you look at it, if it has the wrong number of bathrooms or bedrooms, or if you think, you know, it's listed as a particular condition grade and you think yours is in worse condition, those are things you can challenge. Bring us evidence that shows us it's, we're wrong. We'll correct that and it'll recalculate your assessment. So we want to make sure it's fair. And one of the things I talk about that is the pizza pie. Go 
Go ahead. So, as I said, we don't receive one penny more. You think about when we, at budget time, we set the size of the pie. And what reassessment does is slice it up into pieces. If you're cutting your pizza up and you cut one piece so that it's really big, it doesn't mean you get any more pizza. It just means that whoever gets that slice has a bigger piece. That's the same way with assessment. If your house is reassessed at greater than the average of the town, yes, you will pay a bigger portion of the taxes. Your, your personal tax bill will go up, but the town doesn't get any more. Just as with that pizza, if I make one piece bigger, the other pieces have to get smaller to accommodate. The same thing happens with taxes. If your house value is shooting through the roof um, and your taxes go up, other people's taxes go down. Um, again, that's why we want it to be as fair as possible. Um, someone asked, why did you guys do a reassessment last year during the pandemic? If we didn't, we would get hit with what's called a, a equalization rate penalty. What happens is if we're at 80% of assessed value as determined by the state and or county, they'll hit us with a penalty of 20% or more to get us up to full rate. The problem is not only does that increase our tax rates, it also decreases any discounts or exemptions you get. So all senior discounts, they go down by that same 20%. Veteran discounts down by 20%. So people get hit twice. We actually did the calculation. It would have, people would have paid more in taxes last year or this year if we had not reassessed last year. And as a point to that, the town of Rush's school tax rate is 29% higher than, the, than Henrietta's, even though it's the same school district, right? And the reason is because they were not able to complete their reassessment and therefore they got hit with this equalization rate penalty. Um, the most extreme is Webster, who for whatever reason, uh, it's some deal I guess with Xerox, they've locked in at old um, assessment rates. Their county tax rate is like double everybody else's because of that, that penalty. And again, where you get hurt really bad with that is that means all of their star program discounts from the state, anything like that, they're cut in half. We didn't want to see that happen to our residents. <laughs> so one of the things to point out is that as um, tax levies stay flat, which is that middle graph, as the total assessment goes up, the tax rate goes down. So you can see the, the three graphs. One, the top is the rising total assessed value of properties. The middle is our tax levy. The bottom is the tax rate. Our tax rate is now equal to what it was, I believe, in 2010. So, um, you know, by holding that tax levy flat, the tax rate has been dropping. You know, people said, well, I paid more in taxes. It wasn't just because you got reassessed. In fact, for most people, it wasn't because of reassessment. It was because people increased their tax levies. So the fire district increased their tax levy by 13.1%. Even after you subtract out the um, roughly 85 to 9%, due to uh, real growth and assessment growth, their tax rate still went up by four something percent. The county increased by about 5.5%. It's a little confusing because if you, you can see these numbers on your tax bill, by the way, if you open up your combined tax bill, it'll tell you percent change from previous year levy. The problem with the county is there's two numbers for the county. One is the county bill and they do this thing with this tax, sales tax rebate, so it gets a little complicated. But at the end of the thing, it shows that there was a 6.7% increase. However, below the line, you'll see county services. Um, that went down by about 12%, but it's one-tenth of the other levy, so that averages out to 5.5. So if you can't find that 5.5 number on your tax bill, that's why. The school district increases theirs by 3.8% and the ambulance by 3.6. The reason I have those yellow instead of red is they were below the actual growth of the town, which last year was 3.9%. So what that means is essentially new property owners, new development paid for their increase. As a result of that and the reassessment, the tax rate went down and 
uh, our school district, you know, so not only is our town the lowest town rate outside of Riga, who has a giant landfill dump paying for all the property taxes, we have the lowest school tax rate adjusted by all the equalization. We have that lowest school tax rate in the county as well. So there isn't a more affordable place to live than Henrietta from a taxation standpoint. Um, and as I mentioned, because of those uh, applications of the, the credits back, our tax levy actually went down by 0.4%. So um, again, if you're mad that your taxes went up, don't be mad at the town. Okay, well, you could go. I don't mind as much if it double skips on the title blocks. So changes to town code. So uh, what we have put in place, we added uh, new solar re regulations and incentive zoning. Uh, we're just finishing up the GEIS, actually a supplemental gen generic environmental impact study, which is something you have to do anytime you do a major code change and uh, update to your comprehensive land use plan. Um, but basically what we're looking at we have our first solar project in town, large solar project. Um, it's in the southeast portion of town. It's 25 acres. It's about five megawatts. Um, you'll be able to sign up for solar energy from them shortly. Um, and uh, that was actually done as we were developed. We had put together what we were going to put forth and we actually asked them to be our guinea pigs. They agreed. We basically set it up because it wasn't part of code. We said, here's what the code's gonna be. Do you agree to it essentially by contract? They did. It was great because we found a couple things in the code that weren't really workable and it allowed us to fix it and not have to go through the whole code update process again. So um, thanks to the remote family in Delaware River, River Solar for, for being our uh, guinea pigs on that. Um, we also have incentive zoning to help with uh, what I refer to as drag along infrastructure. So. Um, there's a perfect example, the Masons, Freemasons of New York are looking to build a, a senior living complex. They have two directions they can go for their infrastructure. Along one of those paths, there's a bunch of homes without sewer and water. It's a little bit more expensive for them to go that route because they have to bore under the throughway. We want to give them an incentive to go that route because it means that then all the people along that path could hook up to the sewer. In the other direction, it goes past a bunch of empty farms. It doesn't make, there's no community benefit to uh, going that route. So, um, and then the last, the other stuff we have is uh, also um, incentive for reuse of old buildings. Um, you know, the goal is to try to get some of these uh, dilapidated buildings uh, refurbished. And as you'll see in a few minutes, we've actually made some good progress on that. And I think we can do more, as well as preservation of open space, new parks and other community goals. So again, the idea is if the developer is willing to help us with that, they might be able to get an additional unit per acre, for instance. So code sections that's being updated this coming year. Um, we're, right now we're in the process of working on our driveway code. We get a lot of variances. For the variances that almost always get approved with no real issue, we're baking that into the code so that people don't have to go through the expense and time delay of a variance. Um, we're also fixing some safety issues uh, for on county and state roads that are busy. We're adding into the driveway code the ability to add a turnaround so you'd never have to back into or out of your driveway on a busy road. Um, we're gonna do similar stuff for signs, um, enforcement, ethics, um, a bunch of other cleanup. And of course, the big one is the sudden appearance of cannabis laws. We have to define what portions of town that we want that to happen in. It will probably be a subset of the commercial B1. We don't want it in commercial B2 because those tend to be near um, residences. Um, and even some of the B1s are in and about residence. So we're, we're going to define a subset of the commercial B1 zones that will be allowed to have cannabis shops. Um, we, are, we decided, and again, this isn't all final, this is initial discussions with the town board. Um, we decided it doesn't make sense to opt out. 
since people could buy from adjoining towns, you can't, opting out doesn't mean that people can't smoke in town. It just means they can't buy in town. We would rather have the shops there in a proper location than to, to opt out and not have the, the control over that. So, um, as I mentioned, you know, reuse of existing buildings, we've made a lot of progress. So the big notable one is of course the um, marketplace mall, but also if you don't recognize the building in the upper left corner, that's the old hostess uh, Wonder Bread building. It's now Namaste. It's a um, Indian grocery store. If you don't recognize the life storage in the lower left corner, that's the old um, city circuit. Um, on the right, lower right, that's the Delphi building. Originally, the developer wanted to knock that building down and across the entire structure build the new uh, Amazon distribution the giant warehouse that ended up somewhere on the west side of town, uh, not our town, of the west side of the county. Um, it just did not make sense to go there. Not to mention, I said to the developer, I don't want to lose an iconic building like that. that. So he was able to go out and find a, a, um, a buyer for that building. So um, it's great that we're able to reuse these buildings instead of, you know, um, plowing over green space, or in this case, knocking down an iconic building. Uh, for mixed use overlay districts, this is something we put in place in 2019, and we've seen a bunch of use of this this year. Uh, the two big projects, there's an apartment in a mixed use complex going in. That particular uh, overlay district is what's called our employment, mixed use employment area um, or center. And what that means is, a lot of graduates, um, people coming out of college today, they don't want to have to drive. They would, you know, they, they'll, they will when they need to, but they prefer to as much as possible walk or ride their bikes or other means of transportation. And as part of that, they want residences that are near a, um, that are near where they work. And so th there was a lot of land, this had been zoned industrial, we decided to put an overlay district. You can either build to the industrial district or you can build to this mixed use. And uh, so there's a large project going in there at the corner of Lehigh Station and East River. Um, the, the, the previously, in a previous incarnation, this was gonna be all apartments. And I think that would have overloaded the capacity of that area. So we were very glad when the uh, previous, uh, developer who had that permission sold it and the new developers were willing to do the mixed use instead of the original plans of all apartments. And then on the right is the uh, the marketplace mall is basically putting in a mixed use. They're in the mixed use revitalization area and that is places that are what I refer to as tired retail. Um, you know, it's, it's old retail areas that need some revitalization, but that's hard to do in these days because of the changing nature of brick and mortar retail. And so the mall, um, the green is basically the new uh, medical facilities from the U of R Medical Center for the Orthopedic Center. The purple is a new affordable senior housing complex that's going in. The blue is retail. Um, we didn't have identified on there. There's also civic space, including uh, we consider the main mall, the center court of the mall to be part of that civic space because it's again where people can walk, collect, etc. Major projects in town. It's stuck. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so again, you have our medical center. Um, I must say they have one of the prettiest uh, construction fences I've ever seen. If you haven't been by there, it's this gorgeous blue fence, um, but it's underway. In fact, they gutted the old mall's uh, wing, the Sears wing of the mall, um, because they're going to be opening some of that up as courtyard and, and stuff like that. And then the old Sears building is being converted into a surgery center. Um, the, in the upper left corner, you see the tower that should be starting uh, as part of the next phase of the construction. So very excited about that coming here. Um, you know, now while that will be going off the tax rolls, 
we have lost more value in the mall than that is worth. Um, and so if this can restore the, any of that value to the mall, it will more than make up for the loss of tax revenue from the Sears building. So, um, you know, I think in the end, certainly not at the moment, um, but uh, going forward, I think you will quickly see this will actually become tax revenue positive because of the positive effect it will have on the mall. Um, RIT is doing a student hall for exploration and development. I joked that its nickname is the shed. I said, are they trying to get by with just getting a shed permit, building permit? Um, it's a uh, huge endeavor, as you can see there, largely glass building. Um, so that is, a, it's, it's already underway. It's gonna be a major addition to the campus. Um, and uh, excited to see that development come in as well into town. Uh, we have over at uh, Minotti Crossings. Uh, so last year went into Hobby Lobby. On the right, you can see the new buildings that will be going in front of and to the left of it. So um, again, additional retail space there might be a nice spot for Reliant. <laughs> um, Riverwood Tech Campus is adding a new building. And when they are doing that, they will be adjusting the road so that it becomes a four-way intersection. They're gonna get rid of that strange jog that's been there ever since the Kodak days. Um, and they'll be doing improvements to that intersection there. Um, I should note that every development along East Henrietta Road, or excuse me, along East River Road has to contribute to the seeker mitigation for East River Road to do improvements to, for the general flow of traffic. Um, because as anyone who drives that corridor knows, there are a number of uh, intersections um, as well as places where they could use a center turn lane. So that's all part of the plan. And what we did is we determined what the total amount of new traffic would be when it's fully built out. And then what the total cost of all those improvements to be able to support that traffic divided one by the other. And that's the rate per car added to peak travel times, because that's when it matters. Um, and so we've been doing that in cooperation with the county. We've been collecting the funds, the county's doing the work. Um, so it's a great uh, county slash town partnership uh, that will see uh, significant improvements coming into that corridor. Um, this building, as I drove by today, the steel is already going up for it. It's amazing how fast steel can go up. Uh, MSI, they're over in Wiregrass Office Park. Again, this is south of RIT, um, uh, a significant addition from Lafroy. There's actually an additional one that's starting the process now, additional building going next door. So after that uh, park sat empty for a, a year or two, there's, the people are starting to come in fast and furious. So, um, you know, again, the great thing about all the industrial additions, it helps keep your property taxes down because it means our the the number there's more slices more slices of the pie each slice gets smaller whoops skipped one uh plug power um so one of the um this is a reuse of an existing building this is on john street the um company that was there moved over to the um riverwood tech campus and then the Folks who uh, are handling that building have brought in plug power. Uh, for those unfamiliar with plug power, they produce um, hydrogen fuel cell technology for um, largely for things like forklifts, things that operate inside of a building. And the reason that's critical is their only exhaust is water vapor. So there's no chance of any kind of uh, if I'm getting under combusted, I don't produce any, you know, carbon monoxide or anything like that. It's, it's hydrogen and water. That's it. Um, as far as the Delphi complex, this one has not been approved yet, but I wanted to get in on here because a lot of people asking questions for it. So as I mentioned earlier, they acquiesced to not knocking the building down. Um, and it was a little bit of a challenge because it's an unusual building. Um, it was sold to our Rochester Regional Health. Um, to my understanding, they are going to be using it for administrative offices. 
If they want to bring patients in, they would have to come in for a special use permit and they would have to demonstrate to us that the patient traffic would not overburden the, the roads in that area. Um, this western half of the parcel, uh, they proposed a manufacturer distributor. To date, they've put in what's called a typical plan, which basically that just means we, haven't, we don't have a specific customer, but this is the type of thing we're gonna build. The problem with typical is that since you don't know whether they're gonna have a lot of trucks, you need, uh, they might, so I have to have a lot of truck bays, but they might also be an office, all office space, in which case they have to have a lot of parking space. Or they might have, you know, there's a bunch of, if I'm covering all the bases, it gets a lot of additional stuff. That scared a lot of people at the uh, public hearings. And so what the developer has decided to do, because this is in a sensitive area, it's near our, you know, uh, Western Hamlet, one of the more historic portions of town, he has decided to go and find the customer and he's gonna put in the plan for the specific building that he wants to build. Um, and we've given him parameters, he's dialed his plans way back. So, um, because you know, one of the things we did is during this process, we increased the amount of buffering required around historic properties. Um, we took into account uh, the recommendations from the county road to the south and the state road to the west. Um, we took into account the required them to put up historic facades on this building so it will match the surrounding buildings. So, you know, the town board uh, in listening to the public at the public hearings has put through the seeker process has put a lot of requirements on here and the developer FSI has agreed to all of them. He's actually been very uh, good to work with um, in that respect. And like I said, so right now there's been no approvals granted and this is waiting for uh, him to have a client to come in so that he can put in the plans for the specific building rather than a generic building. And similarly, oh, I'm sorry, I thought there was an, uh, one of the ones that went in is the um, sheriff station went in next door to town hall. So when I first got into office, we started talking about with the, the new sheriff, um, Todd Baxter, wanted to have a more central location. If you didn't know where the old sheriff's office was, you're not alone. It was tucked in the, it tucked in the back of an industrial park um, off of Summit Park, which is, if you know where the Tim Hortons is um, on um, West Henrietta Road and Lehigh Station Road, it's kind of on the back side of that block. Um, he wanted to be in a more central area so they could have a more community presence. Um, people could uh, more readily come in and, and talk with the sheriffs. We were looking at doing it on town hall under the previous county administration that was going nowhere. Um, they were essentially putting all the risk on the town and none on the county. Um, and, and risk is even a funny term, but um, thankfully uh, one a local developer, um, Andy Galena, purchased the property right next door because both the sheriff's office and the town felt it was very important to have it near the town hall complex in the center of town, especially because our plan is to put the new court right next door to that. Um, the uh, Andy Galena bought the property right next door to town hall and built the new facility there. So, um, you know, again, another good partnership, uh, at least between, in this case, not so much with the count, former county executive, but certainly with the uh, county sheriffs and the town, and in this case, also a private developer. Uh, Dunwood Green, um, this was a development approved. You, you, they've been doing a lot of work on it. This is on a portion of Locust Hill. This is the area where they used to have the bus turnaround during the LPGA events, um, as well as essentially storage. Um, you know, it's, this, was, this was a tough one for the town board because as anyone who drives that section of Jefferson Road knows, it's not the best from a traffic standpoint. It drives us crazy that the state DOT is unwilling to put a light at, uh, what's it called, Edgewood. Um, it, it's just, 
perplexing. Um, they won't, nor we've also asked would they put in a center turn lane so that people queuing up because the problem is people are backed up during busy times to turn left and cars come flying around on the shoulder. God forbid there's ever a pedestrian or a cyclist on that shoulder, they're gonna get creamed. Um, so we really did not wanna add to the traffic, but we also knew that Locust Hill, like most country clubs, Locust Hill is struggling. Locust Hill represents the largest expanse of open space in town. We would have hate to see it go under and be sold off to developers. And I think everybody in that area would agree with that. And so this project, in addition to this, brings in much needed capital from the sale of the land to the developer, but also those people who are living there, the, the plan and the way they're gonna sell it, they're also going to be members of the club. So it not only brings in capital, but it also brings in revenue. Um, that should help keep Locust Hill viable for years to come. So as much as we hated the additional traffic, we thought from a greater good standpoint, we wanted to see Locust Hill survive. So we okayed it. Um, you know, again, for some people nearby who deal with that traffic, they're probably not happy with us. And, um, but it just made the most sense for the community. Whoops, went forward too. There's a couple developments going on in Riverton. Um, this is parcel E. These will be new garden apartments. Uh, if you don't know what a garden apartment is, it was defined as part of the Riverton. It basically means they have their own separate entrances and that at least one of their entrance empties out onto a garden-like appearance. So it basically means there can't be buildings behind their buildings. It has to be grassy and treed areas. Um, in addition, they couldn't have large parking fields. Um, and so they met those requirements. Um, they're gonna be doing a trail. One of the other things I discussed with them, in the middle, there's a parcel there. It's about a nine acre parcel that actually belongs to the school. It was done as part of the original Riverton development. The problem is the codes have changed such as the school district can't build a elementary school on a nine acre parcel. I believe the minimum is 12 and they actually prefer 15. So I talked with the developer and we have an easement over that portion, empty portion in the middle that it either remains wild or sells to the school district for the development of a school. Um, and so uh, if there's ever determined a need with all the new homes over here to build an elementary school in this portion of town, they would actually be able to use this land. Um, so, uh, you know, again, that's part of, was part of the seeker process. And a lot of people wanted to see this area stay wild. The thing I point out to them, is that fair to the property owners of the last people to develop? You know, would you be okay with when you are ready to move out of your house that you can't sell it, instead we knock it down and turn it wild? Of course you wouldn't, but that's what you're essentially asking the owners of these other properties to do. Um, you know, we create incentives for open space. We create zoning changes to encourage open space. Um, and even in the southern portion, the rural residential areas to require open space, but we cannot take somebody's property rights as open space unless we're willing to pay for it. Well, in order to pay for it, we would have to raise taxes, which is not something people want to do. That is what Pittsburgh did. Pittsburgh raised taxes and they bought up a bunch of empty properties. And if people really are interested in that, they can contact me and we can put it on as a referendum. But um, you know, it's not something that we, that as a town, we can just take empty, empty spaces. Uh, the other big development going in there is parcels A and B. It's usually just referred to as parcel A because that's the larger portion. This is called the fairways at Riverton. They're mostly single family homes and duplexes. So one of the things in these approval processes, uh, this area has actually already been approved for all this development. Um, if the plans have changed from the original plans, which both of these have, we have to make sure they're consistent. And so that's why at the old one, thankfully they were putting in garden apartments because the percentage of regular apartment buildings, Riverton is full. They can't actually add any more apartment buildings um, to that area per the original design criteria of Riverton. 
Um, they can, they still have room for garden apartments and they still have room for additional um, townhomes, which a duplex is considered. Um, and there's no restriction on single family homes. So in terms of percentage. So um, you're seeing that develop. One of the things we're doing with this, we are working on a river walk trail that will go from um, Riverwood Tech Campus all the way south into Rush. We're doing this in uh, partnership with uh, the town of Rush as part of the local waterfront revitalization program from the New York State Department of State. Um, so it's sort of a three-way cooperation. Um, but one of the challenges we have is getting people past the golf course without getting hit. We've had this for a long time. There was that right of way through the middle of this property that caused them issues. So I negotiated with them is to take that same area and put a line along the edge of this property. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring the Riverwalk Trail to the outside of the golf course um, where people won't get hit by golf balls because the only along the river, you're right along the fairways, you're going to get hit. Um, so this pulls them a bit further away. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take the access from Riverton. We're going to bring it over. We're working with the New York State Department of Transportation for, to determine the safest place to put a pedestrian crossing on that road so we can get to the other side. Um, and then uh, we'll continue that trail all the way south into Breeze Park and then from there south into the Rush Riverside Refuge. And then one of the ones, again, this one hasn't been approved yet. This is the Lehigh Ridge subdivision. When the Wedgwood on the Green development went in, that's Authors Nevins, as well as the stuff across the, the way. Um, there was actually a phase three that was south of the power lines. This is that plus a little bit more. Now in the public hearing, there was a lot of concern about bringing that traffic up Authors Avenue because of the elementary school there. And so we've been working with the developer on finding alternative exits. They have to have two roads in and out uh, to authors. We don't think, I know that some of the folks on Nevins would prefer not to have the traffic, although a bunch of them were willing to trade the traffic if we could get them sidewalks. Um, so that goes back to that drag along infrastructure, the incentives. But we are actually working with the um, Elks Lodge next door who owns the land just off to the east there see if we can get out to East Henrietta Road that way um, so that we don't have to come up authors. If that were the case, what we would do is we would have them put a turnaround at the end of authors because today it just dead ends. Again, the original plan was for authors and Nevins to loop around and connect. We would put a dead end and we would continue the sidewalk so any of the kids in this neighborhood would be able to walk to um, Sherman School um, and not have to ride a bus or drive or whatever. But again, no approvals have been granted yet. So they're looking at those alternative uh, entrances. Uh, some new restaurants in town. Um, the old Chili's is being turned into three restaurants. The main portion will be Mission Barbecue. And then on the other side will be Crumble Cookies and Tropical Cafe. So. Um, at the town board, we always complain that how come they don't bring us free samples when they're coming in for their approval, especially the cookie and uh, smoothie places. <laughs> it's not just Lisa. Um, <clears throat> we also see some additional, you know, in terms of reuse of buildings, restaurants are above and beyond anything else. Now, part of that is also because if you know anything about business, restaurants close at a higher rate than any other business. Um, so Babylon Restaurant is going in at 1475 East Henrietta Road. Taco Bell, a new Taco Bell is being built at 1008 Lehigh Station Road. There's a couple others. These were the only ones I could actually get renderings from. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of new restaurants coming in. Um, some are chains. Some are uh, individuals like Babylon. Um, so, you know, again, as, as people start going back out to eat, they're going to have a lot of good options. Uh, major initiatives. Um, so, you know, one of the things I've been working towards is improving the infrastructure. So, you know, again, we're going to continue to expand the east um, 
Henrietta Road sidewalks. In the upper right, you see the new Jefferson Road sidewalks. We're going to be adding the Highland Road sidewalks. Um, we've been going after a bunch of community development block grants to, to bring sewers to uh, some of these neighborhoods whose septic systems are starting to fail. And because of a Joyce, uh, excuse me, adjacent development, it's much more difficult for them to put in new septic. Um, so we're working with the community development block grant, which is done through the county and HUD in order to uh, bring the cost down to where it's affordable for our residents. And then we've also been uh, increasing our paving capacity so that we can pave more roads every year to keep all of the town roads in better conditions. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've got the local waterfront revitalization plan. Um, the, the highlight piece will be a Riverwalk connection, um, go all the way down in the early phase down to 251 and potentially all the way down to the Diamond Trail, the Lehigh Valley Diamond Trail that has the bridge over Genesee River, um, which would make for some really great uh, loop interconnects, trail interconnects. Um, but we're also working on a canal side public area with benches, tables, and hopefully an ice cream shop, kind of think like you have in front of Schoen Place. This would actually be on the north side. We're working with the JCC. They would provide some land for that. Um, and we, and as well as access for, for parking. Um, we're working on a bunch of interconnecting roads or sidewalks, uh, one along East River Road, and then ultimately we wanna do one along Bailey Road so that, again, this would then connect, for those who don't know, the Lehigh Valley Trail North Branch, uh, after coming through the park, actually goes up John Street and continues all the way to Genesee Valley Trail, or Genesee Valley Park, excuse me, this would connect the two of them so that again, you'd have all these different loops and interconnects you could do on our trail systems. We'd be looking at canoe and kayak launches as well as additional park improvements. Um, the good news is we just got word that uh, Sam Grant, or Dasney Grant, I think it was Sam, that we put in a while ago was actually was finally approved. It was put in three years ago. So you'll see uh, new improvements to Breeze Park. Um, town campus improvements, I already talked about the town court, I already talked about the sewer and drainage garage, as well as the new facilities garage. There's currently this old dilapidated garage from the old DPW that's falling apart. And so our plan is to remove that. That's where the new sewer and drainage garage will go but that's currently being used by facilities. So we're essentially building a pole barn for the facilities. Um, that, in fact, that uh, approval of the bids is on the agenda for tonight. Um, we're applying New York State for financial assistance to improve the uh, east wing of Town Hall. We might be able to do that under the COVID relief, the ARPA, um, again, depending on what they say. And then uh, we've received a donation of a historic carriage house, and we're now working on relocating that to Tinker Park. It's actually very similar to the carriage house that used to be at the Tinker Homestead years and years ago. Uh, excuse me. Um, we just completed uh, um, an agreement with the school district. Um, as Many people remember they took over the old Good Shepherd property. It was a whole lot of um, land, but it also included two historic buildings that they didn't want to see destroyed. But the one they had zero use, their building codes wouldn't allow them to use the old farmhouse. And the church would have been very costly for them to upgrade in, in the, to be both consistent historic and consistent with the school codes. So we worked out a deal. We carved it as tight as we could. Um, brought those two properties over to the town. And what the town's going to do is we're going to be responsible for their upkeep. Um, the church will become a public facility, much like you could rent a cabin, but it's going to be a phenomenal space. I could see people renting it for weddings, uh, dance recitals, all sorts of stuff like that. We've also put in an agreement to the school district that their student clubs and organizations will be able to use it um, so that... Um, you know, it, it'll continue to bring benefit to the school district as well as to the town. The farmhouse we're looking to use, it's not 
a big open space. It's not good for something like that. But we have a number of community organizations that have no place to live. Um, and they provide direct benefit to the town. And so our plan is we're going to make that essentially a combined office space for all those communities. The, like the living room will be the meeting room. And then each of the individual rooms will be their office. Um, and so those are organizations like Raft, RHAA, Rotary Club, Henrietta Foundation, Garden Club. These are all organizations that donate their time and effort and often money, like the Rotary Club, to do improvements to the town facilities. Um, and so we want to essentially give back to them. Uh, town park improvements. So we are expanding uh, Veterans Memorial Park. I know that's a challenge in the center of town, but we're gonna be actually acquiring land to the Southwest and our plan right now, it could change, but would be to put a ferry walk on there. Um, I wouldn't do it with just a single artist. What I would do is reach out to community organizations, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, that they could submit houses for the town to install. Um, and so it's in an area that doesn't see a ton of wildlife so the issues that we had with the conflict at Tinker wouldn't be present at this location. Um, and, you know, it could provide a nice ferry walk for, for kids in town. Um, we're building an educator's grove in Hoskins Park. For those who don't know Hoskins Park, it's at where Pinnacle and Winton split. Um, it's a narrow park with a busy road on either side, so it's not a good place for a playground. The educator's grove, came out of the desire of a number of uh, alumni from the Rush Henry Central School District to honor uh, educators who had a big impact on their lives. And so the idea is there'll be a center grove with um, pavers surrounded by benches, surrounded by trees, and people will be able to essentially purchase or donate pavers, benches, plaques, or trees honoring those educators um, we're doing it in cooperation with the school, um, you know, because one of the things, if anyone's been following what's happened out in Hilton, we certainly wouldn't want to honor somebody who committed heinous acts like he did. Um, but, you know, so we're doing, we're putting that together. In fact, we just put out a call for uh, membership for our, actually tonight, we're, I think this is when we actually already have the members of that committee. We're approving that tonight. Um, so that, that'll be moving forward. As I mentioned, we just got the extra funding for the exercise trail for Breeze Park. We'll be adding Chapman's Corner. Um, it's the southeast corner of Erie Station and West Henrietta Road. It's gonna be a historic oriented park. We're actually looking to put a fountain in there because we don't have any fountains in town. Um, so it's gonna be more of a fountain benches kind of park. Um, and then the old Three Sisters ice cream we're gonna take the front facade off, turn the inside of it, essentially there'll be a bunch of historic displays under a roof to, to celebrate the history of the town and especially the, the Western Hamlet. Um, one of the things that we still have the plans and in the budget, but it's all gonna be financially, you know, contingent on available funds is a water park in Veterans Memorial Park. So um, the preliminary plans are set to go. It's just gonna be based off of uh, funding available. Um, we're acquiring new land on Ward Hill for a park. It's gonna be a, more of a hiking trail park. There'll probably be a pavilion and a small rest area, but there'll be a bunch of hiking trails through the woods that'll connect into the Lehigh Valley Trail. And then as part of that Lehigh Ridge, if that goes through, we may acquire the old Belfry Golf Course. Um, in my proposal, if, assuming we can get, figure out how to do this from a liability standpoint, we would make it a motocross park because we have problems with kids riding four wheelers and dirt bikes on our neighborhood streets. And part of when we do have them, when the sheriffs do stop them, one of their issues is, well, we don't have any legal place to go. This would provide a legal place to go. It's where they go today. The problem is today there's no access to it. So they zip down the Lehigh Valley Trail, which is dangerous. So we would, I've already had discussions with the, uh, Freemasons in New York, that we would swap some land with what they're doing so that we could bring an entrance off of um, Middle Road and have a parking lot there for people to be able to drive over with their, their motocross toys. 
Whoop, and that's about it. So thank you for attending, um, whether it's in person or online. And uh, I don't know if we're gonna have the ability to handle questions, but um, I will certainly uh, start with if there's any questions in the audience here. Um, and I'll just repeat them since you guys don't have mics, unless we've got to pass around mic. Oh, he does. Look at Brian is well prepared. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, a lot of people ask me, are you recording this because we want to watch it later? So. Any other questions? Well, that's good because we're one minute to go to end the event. So thank you very much. Great presentation. Thanks, Steve. Just real quick, just want to say thank you to Adrian, our host here, the director of the library and uh, former chamber president. So thank you so much for hosting us. It's a beautiful library. Big thank you to Brian, BRL Entertainment Solutions. Always does a great job. Thank you very much. And uh, it's just great to be back in a room with all of you. It's a, a great room of Henrietta leaders and uh, excited for future events to come down the pike here from the chamber. So please keep an eye out for those uh, in, in the coming weeks and months. And thank you again.